Okay, so it's 702 and uh, we will get started. Thank you so much for joining this town hall. I am State Representative Kimberly Fiorello, uh, representing Greenwich and Stamford. I am going to be sort of managing the Zoom on my own today, so I appreciate all your patience. I sit on the Education Committee in the Connecticut General Assembly, and this town hall is my effort to respond to the inquiries of parents in my district and in our state. Um, who wanted to better understand what is it that our children are being taught. And to that end, earlier, I hosted a Zoom with Peter Wood, who discussed a critical response to the 1619 project. And I hope today to continue that conversation uh, with Robert Woodson, Bob Woodson, and Ian Rowe, who will discuss with us uh, 1776 Unites a curriculum and they will also share their experiences in the field of education. So tonight's town hall um, will go like this. I will make the introductions of Bob and Ian and then I would like to set the stage for our conversation, um, sort of give a background on Connecticut and introduce the 1776 Unites curriculum and then I will ask the first one or two questions and but this is really meant to be an opportunity for us to engage with these national thought leaders on education so please uh, raise your digital hand and as soon as i see a hand pop up um, i will let you ask your question i only ask for two courtesies please turn your camera on when you speak and uh, please frame your thoughts in a question so that uh, we do have a dialogue Okay, and for now the chat room is closed and uh, once we open up to the broader Q&A, um, I'll open the chat room for everyone. Okay, so uh, we have with us today, Bob Woodson, founder and president of the Woodson Center, which he founded in 1981 to help residents in low income neighborhoods address the problems of their communities. A former civil rights activist, he has headed the National Urban League Department of Criminal Justice. He's known as the godfather of the neighborhood empowerment movement for more than 40 years. And Bob has a special concern for the problems of young people. He is an early MacArthur Genius Award awardee and the recipient of the 2008 Bradley Prize, the Presidential Citizens Award, and the 2008 Social Entrepreneurship Award from the Manhattan Institute. And please pick up his two recent books, Red, White, and Black, Rescuing American History, and Lessons, and his second book, Lessons from the Least of These, The Woodson Principles. And also with us is Ian Rowe the resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, where he focuses on upward mobility, education, family formation, and adoption. Mr. Rowe is a social entrepreneur with more than 30 years of experience founding and leading organizations. He is the co-founder of Vertex Partnership Academies, a network of character-based international baccalaureate high schools that will be opening in the Bronx in 2022. He is also chairman of the board of Spence Chapin, one of our country's premier adoption agencies. Mr. Rowe currently is a senior visiting fellow at the Woodson Center and a writer for the 1776 Unites campaign. So thank you so much, Bob and Ian, for zooming in and joining us here in Connecticut. Thank you for having us. The uh, Constitution State, uh, and specifically the towns that I represent, Greenwich and Stamford, I extend a very warm welcome to you both. So I will jump in with two points on background, and I will share my screen at this point. Um, OK, so what I wanted to share with everyone is uh, this point, which is in our state of Connecticut, Bob and Ian, we have something called the State 
Education Resource Center. This is a sort of quasi government agency and they have a very special and important job of um, creating curriculum, partnering with the Department of Education in Connecticut to create curriculum. And last week, they came out with a public statement about critical race theory. Um, many parents have been uh, engaging at the school board level. And sometimes you have superintendents who say, um, we don't have critical race theory in our district. Uh, we had that in Greenwich where our superintendent said, there's no critical race theory here. Um, however, CERC did make a statement last week about critical race theory. And um, it basically says here, it does say its credibility, which is that Connecticut, the state of Connecticut puts its trust in CERC to lead the coordination and development of a curriculum called Concerning the Inclusion of Black and Latino Studies. This is, I believe we're the first states to do this. This was uh, very much in the news. And it says, through our research, critical race theory has emerged as a foundational framework to understand structural racism. It goes on here at the second to last paragraph to say, we see uh, these, you know, black African American, black Puerto Rican, Latino course of studies as a significant first step in creating a vision for how racial equity and cultural responsiveness result in improved student performance. Um, and it says here, lastly, it is a long process to becoming intentional about dismantling systemic racism. So that is, uh, you know, that's, that's sort of a broader picture of where education is in Connecticut. Um, before I jump to 1776 Unites, uh, Ian or Bob, do you have some thoughts in, in understanding that you know, we have a major quasi-governmental agency that is embracing CRT. Um, I think Bob, I said Bob, Bob, Bob can answer me. first and then Ian will go next for our okay. Zoom. Yeah, I uh, reading through this document, um, it talks about uh, 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 reflect, critical, interrogate, critical, interrupt, not one place that I see that it improves the academic outcomes for children, nor did it ever say in any place that as a consequence of addressing systemic racism, the grades uh, and for overall academic performance of children have been improved. Uh, later on in our presentation, we will give you evidence that under conditions in the past, uh, education outcomes for children were able to, to improve. So, uh, so that's what jumps out at me. I don't see anything in this document that makes a case that the educational outcomes for children improve. And, uh, yeah. and uh, I, I, I would definitely agree with that. I mean, one of the, I think one of the challenges always in this discussion around critical race theory is that it's so rarely defined. Mm -hmm. It's just this sort of abstract, concept and when it is defined it's usually done in this very benign uh, innocent fashion like what you just read there so it's important to actually go back to the people who crafted critical race theory because it's a much more threatening uh, you know by the people who created it so Richard Delgado wrote a book called critical race theory an introduction and this is literally how he define it defines it in the very beginning of the book Unlike, quote, unlike traditional civil rights, which embraces incrementalism and step-by-step -step progress, critical race theory questions the very foundations of the liberal order, including equality theory, equal opportunity, equal protection, equal rights. It questions legal reasoning. It questions enlightenment rationalism and it questions neutral principles of constitutional law, end quote. So it's really important to have that as a formal definition. Anytime you're talking to someone about critical race theory and they're trying to define it, this is what the 
the intellectual giant behind this theory and puts forth. So, so the reason it's important to ground all of this in a common definition is that it's not this floofy language of it's just a framework. It literally is questioning the very foundations of the liberal order. So that's why when it says it questions equality theory, that's why in almost all of these implementations, you never see the word equality. There's always been replaced by the word equity. So whenever you see that, that's critical race theory in action. Whenever you're seeing equity as the dominant goal, you have now supplanted equality theory for equity. And so even if someone says, well, no, no, there's nothing here, nothing here, just move on. We're not doing CRT. These are the, pra these are the uh, emblems of why you know uh, critical race theory is being implemented. And as Bob said, there's absolutely zero connection. And I've run schools in the heart of the South Bronx for the last decade. Uh, there is absolutely no relationship between teaching kids they live in a permanently racist country and them suddenly having better outcomes in math, science, English. It doesn't happen. Okay, okay, great. Thank you, Ian. Um, and then uh, the second sort of uh, background that I'd like to present for all of us uh, for the sake of our conversation is to introduce everyone to uh, 1776 Unites. So if you go to the 1776 Unites website, you will have a chance to register for free lessons. Um, once you get that link, it comes to curriculums that you can download. And uh, I wanted to ask um, Bob and Ian, they have so far 12 lessons here. And um, you have these wonderful stories about Alice Coachman. I read through um, this one down here further. Let me see, I did open it to the side. Um, the Real McCoy. So these lessons open as uh, PDF presentations. Um, you give all this wonderful background information on the setting of the stories. And then it also gives you uh, chances to ask questions. Um, what do you say to those who would say your examples of black excellence are just outliers far and few between? Bob, do you wanna take that one first? You go ahead, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I've, I've often heard that charge that somehow if you uh, focus on sort of exemplars, uh, the, you know, th those, are, uh, those are the outliers, th those are the outliers, those are the exceptions. When the reality is, what's ironic is that people like George Floyd, those are the extreme outlier for the black community. And yet his case almost becomes the face of black America. You know, the, the share of black men who were poor in 1960 was 41%. In 2016, it was 18%. The vast majority of black people are not in poverty, not in jail, uh, not, um, you know, not committing crimes, are not the general narrative that you see. So what's interesting is that this idea of black excellence is actually generally the norm in terms of the way people live their day-to-day -day lives. What has become the stereotype are the faces of these quote unquote unarmed black people that are killed by police. And that suggests that all black people are living under the thumb of a white oppressor. And one of the things that we wanna do in 1776 Unites is just, is just, flip, just, flip that, just flip that script basically. And part of the reason we built a curriculum is so that young kids, uh, kindergarten through 12th grade, can see that there are lots and lots and lots of examples of black excellence that was the norm, right? Let me, that, yes. Yeah, I mean, go, go ahead, Bob, go ahead. Yeah, Bob. but I, I just want to take go an example. Uh, one of the fundamental propositions of critical race theory is that we must address this because uh, of the disparities you see in uh, black incomes, uh, education levels today, that somehow 
the, the present day problems are related to the historic, uh, the history of slavery and, and, and Jim Crow, that that explains these disparities. So in our essays, we demonstrate, for instance, between 1920 and 1940, in the 1920, the, the, the educational uh, 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 level of education was eighth grade for whites and fifth grade for blacks in 1920. Because Booker T. Washington partnered with um, uh, the, uh, the head of Sears and Julius Rosenwald, and they partnered together. Rosemont put up $4 million. The black community raised $4.8 million. And they, together, they built 5,000 Rosenwald schools in the rural South. And as a consequence of this, they had used textbooks, half the budgets of the white schools. And yet, within between 1920 and 1940, the education gap in the South closed from, from three years to six months. So if Blacks were able to close the education gap during the time when racism was enshrined in law and Jim Crow was the rule, the question then is, if we were able to close the education gap under those conditions, why can we not do that today with many of the major urban education systems run by Blacks with the per capita expenditures that are extremely high? That's the question that we must, and that I don't think 5,000 schools and closing a, a, a gap within six, uh, from three years to six months is an outlier. <laughs> yeah, and it's also true, and by the way, there are more black kids in college than there are you know, in prison, which is a terrible comparison. But again, in the general zeitgeist, you had the sense that all these black kids are just being shot by the police, arrested by the police, they're in jail. And the, 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 the reality is, is very different. And, and I think one of the other challenges here is that anytime there are these disparities or you, you're focusing on black excellence because the real problem is that there are these huge disparities, there's also this underlying assumption that every racial disparity must be due to structural racism. And whether it be in income, uh, uh, marriage rates, poverty, incarceration rates, there are a lot of factors that drive uh, why outcomes are the way they are. And race is certainly one factor. But when you develop this monocausal view of the world, you ignore a lot of other factors like, like family structure, like access to, to good schools so kids can get a great education. Is there a school choice apparatus for low-income kids? There are a lot of factors that drive disparities. And we just need to have an honest conversation that includes race as one of the factors, but solely not the dominant factor in most of these outcomes. Yes, and uh, to that end, I wanted to share how you guys treat the um, Tulsa race massacres. So if you download uh, 1776 lessons on Tulsa, uh, first of all, it's a massive document, and uh, let me open the files here, but I'm just walking through the experience so everyone can see what it would be like. So in part one, um, let's see, I'll open the PDF. So I feel that you guys are really very honest about um, the experience. You, I mean, these photos are amazing. I'm sorry, we can't read through it all but you do go through and discuss the setting of what happened out here in Oklahoma. Who were the people who were out there and what did they accomplish? Why was there this racial tension? Um, and then you also, you have a part two, which I think is so important, um, part two. The triumph. Yes, yep. Well, as, as you're going through it, th this was a very, this is a very deliberate uh, part of our strategy. And, and Bob can really uh, talk to you about, talk uh, this through even more. But when we saw the New York Times 1619 project after, you know, issuing these statements that the country was actually founded in 1619 and not 1776, or that 
the American Revolution was actually fought uh, to defend slavery. I mean, just complete um, uh, misstatements of the truth. They, they put together a curriculum and it had been distributed in places like Buffalo, Chicago, some of the lowest performing schools in the country. And Bob had the great idea to say, look, we can't just launch 1776 Unites and just have essays and just be speaking out. We have to create content. We have to fight fire with fire. We had to have an empowering alternative. And so Bob had the idea to why don't we create a free K to 12 curriculum that any teacher in the country could have access to. And this curriculum would, would do like 1619 was saying it was doing to tell the African-American experience in the United States, but we want to do it warts and all. So we're not just cherry picking the most egregious examples of, of uh, American horror as it related to slavery. Because if you want to do that, if you want to weave a narrative solely of horrific stories, you can do that. But we thought it was important to say warts and all. So teach about the Tulsa massacre and then talk about what led up to the Tulsa massacre. Why was it that there was such a rise in black incomes, the creation of Black Wall Street, and then what happened afterwards? So this idea of terror and triumph is really important. I mean, one of the most patriotic things we can do is actually just tell the truth about American history. The, the, the true story about American history, it's challenging, but it's a, it's a, it's a story of a country whose founding principles have been the anchor to continue to be this more perfect union where the embrace of founding principles around faith, family, hard work, entrepreneurship, free enterprise, those have been the tools to move whole groups of people from persecution to prosperity. And Bob, I wanted to tell you, I apologize. I am muting you when Ian that's speaks that's, because- that's fine. There's some feedback, so I, I, I mute you, but please, you'll have to unmute yourself each time. <laughs> Go okay, ahead. Okay, that's fine. But uh, just to make the, the very simple case, if I were to do a survey of everyone participating in this seminar and ask them uh, what their credit card debt was, their mortgage payments, car loans, uh, if I just ask about their deficits and then I just will walk away, I said, these people are in bad shape. The only way that I can uh, ascertain their net worth, I have to look at their assets versus their liabilities. Well, you've got to look at Black American history the same way. Why, were, why was the Black Wall Street envied to the point where they wanted to tear it down? There were five Black men in 1920 who owned their own private planes. They had hotels. It was burned down, but it was also rebuilt. But if we only talk about it being burned down and not talk about what was burned and what was rebuilt, we're not telling the complete story. So our essays attempts to tell the complete story. That's all we're asking. And I want to show just a little bit more of my screen to share that. Um, so you do tell a complete story, which I had no idea that the story in Tulsa goes on to include eminent domain and what happens when those with political power try to take over um, what had you know, been the demise of the town because of the fires during that race massacre. But you're able to fend it off with black attorneys that push back and defend private property rights. And there is a renewal that happens. And then there's something that happens in the 50s and 60s which is the urban renewal. And, and this is a fascinating story. And you have a quote here of Mabel Little who survived the um, massacre 50 years earlier, but says that the big government overreach of urban renewal is more destructive. Could you comment on that? Because that is, you know, that's a beautiful, it takes us from triumph, terror to triumph to terror again. And, um, and yet, and this is at the hand of political power. Uh, yeah, let me, let me just say that in every major center, uh, city, there was a Black Wall Street. In 1929, in the, in the Bronzeville section of Chicago, there were 731 Black owned businesses and 100 million in real estate assets. In the Hayti section of Durham, North Carolina, 
you had 100 businesses uh, flourishing. The median income with Blacks in 1940 was comparable to whites on nationally. But what, uh, what the Klan and uh, 100 years of racism could not destroy, government overreach in just four or five years of urban renewal totally wiped out. Every we had the Wallahaji Hotel in Atlanta, the St. Uh, Teresa Hotel in New York, the St. Charles in Chicago, the Wallahaji and the Carver Hotel in Miami. Everyone saw a freeway come through that community. So, and, and there was great resistance of government overreach. So, what uh, the Klan and racism couldn't destroy, urban renewal did that in five years. But Bob, that example of the overreach of government and the highway coming through, is that an example of systemic racism? I don't know. It, it had the consequence of destroying the, the, the Black community. Yeah, I mean, if you really want to see systemic racism, that would be an example. But what we're witnessing today, um, those things are, are, are history. But, but you cannot say that those same forces are alive today. Yeah, this was a racism. I grew up on segregation. Yeah, to me, that was racism. So I know what it looks like, <laughs> close I mean, up and personal. Yeah. And, I mean, and, and nothing, and that does not compare with what we're witnessing today. Give me an example of anything that's comparable uh, to, to, to that. I can't think of anything today. Yeah. I mean, Kimberly, it's a good it's a good question to ask, uh, you know, in the in the neighborhood in the South Bronx where I run schools in this particular district. If you were a ninth grader in 2015, four years later, only two percent graduated from high school ready for college, meaning that you started high school in ninth grade in 2015 and you dropped out over the course of four years where you actually did graduate, but you still couldn't do uh, basic reading nor math without remediation if you went to community college. But in this district, there is no school choice. There's a cap on the number of charter schools that can be open. So if you had a great idea to want to help serve primarily Black and Hispanic kids, you couldn't. So that's a policy that has clearly a structural, systemic, institutional negative impact on kids because they're forced to send their um, they're forced to go to schools that only 2% are graduating from high school ready for college. So there are laws, there are policies that are structural barriers that are having a disproportionate impact, but they're just typically not the ones that are in the zeitgeist that are somehow examples of systemic racism. That's exactly right. Um, yeah. And we are, we, we want to fight for school choice in Connecticut. Excellent. Um, it's 7.30, so if, it, as we are listening, everybody who's on the call, if you have questions, please raise your digital hand. I will also open up the chat room so folks can um, uh, have a conversation on the side. I wanted to, I'll keep going with my questions. Um, Bob and Ian, you know, propaganda is where they use something that is true, like, there are racists in America, racism is real. And then they hang it on a half truth. Racism is systemic. Maybe racism was once systemic or maybe there are places like we just identified where there are structural uh, impediments. And then they wrap it up in a big fat lie. America is racist. And we are living in an age where our language is like a big salad. You know, um, it's a propagandist word salad with implicit, explicit bias, inclusivity education, spirit murdering, normativity, white social capital, et cetera. How do you advise us to keep our minds clear in the face of such purposeful fogging of our brain? Well, first of all, what the goal of the, of the Woodson Center in 1776 is to deracialize race. And to dissect and desegregate poverty. The big issue today is upward mobility for all low income people. That's what we ought to be focusing on. But anytime you generalize about a group, 
and then try to apply remedies to help that group, it always helps those at the top who are already well off and well educated at the expense of those at the bottom. And that is, I'll give you an example. They're talking about systemic racism. So Coca-Cola says, well, in response, we're going to make sure that 30% of the attorneys doing business with our company are black. Well, how does that, how does giving uh, a, 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 an extra help to people who are already well off at the expense of those, how does that help a black woman living in public housing? In other words, it's, it's, it's a kind of a, a bait and switch game where we use the demographics of those at the, at the, at, at the bottom to propose remedies that have the consequence of helping those at the top and call that equity. <laughs> yeah, and, and one, I, that's so good, Bob. And one of the ways I answer this is to actually look at the performance of uh, white students and white adults. So uh, there's something called the Nation's Report Card, the National Assessment for Educational Progress. It's been given since the early, 90, early 90s. It's given every two years at fourth grade, eighth grade, and 12th grade uh, in, in uh, reading and in math. In the entire history of the National Assessment for Educational Progress, since 1992, every two years, there has never been a situation in which even a majority of white students are reading at grade level. Never in the history of the National Assessment for Educational Progress, never. And so in the last year that was given in 2019, at fourth grade, eighth grade, and 12th grade, the cumulative number of white students who could not read at grade level was 3.75 million kids. That compares to 1.4 million black kids who are not reading at fourth grade, eighth grade, and 12th grade. And yes, there are more white kids overall, but the point is that the reason that there are nearly 4 million white kids that are not reading at grade level in fourth, eighth, and 12th grade is unlikely that that's related to systemic racism. Right. So, again, there are a lot of issues such as, again, lack of school choice. Do most of these kids have access to high quality schools that are teaching them basic reading? Are they growing up in stable families where the evidence shows that if you're born into a married two parent household, your incomes are far, your outcomes are far better than if you're born into a single parent household? Are they being taught by teachers who understand the science of reading? These are big factors, but when you start to have this narrow view of the world that everything must be about systemic racism and the only kids that are suffering in our country are these poor little black kids, you lose sight of the fact that just what Bob said, there's a lot of pain across our country and it's much more related to class than it is race. So I think one of the ways to address this, and I would do this in Connecticut, do the same analysis that I just did, because I did it in Rhode Island when I testified there uh, a couple of months ago. I just looked at the basic um, reading scores and it showed that I think it was something like 3,500 white students in Rhode Island were not reading at grade level at, I think at eighth grade and something like four or 500 black students weren't. And again, there were more white students overall, but the point is if you solely focus on race and where you're only looking at negative black outcomes, you ignore this larger picture, which would likely identify that there are issues outside of racism that are far more relevant to why kids of all races are not succeeding at the highest levels. May I, may I offer just one example of a solution that we crafted in, uh, at, at the Woodson Center uh, over 20 years ago, we were involved in reducing violence in communities, and we developed a community-based approach to that. We took it to the Milwaukee school system uh, because a lot of the, the, the problems that children were having are related to discipline, if not themselves, others. And so what we did was we hired young adults who are five or six years older and placed them as school staff, as moral mentors and character coaches in the schools. And they were able to act as interveners and, and they began to develop relationships and they began to uh, address conflicts among the students. And as a consequence, crime went down, um, if suspensions were reduced, uh, grades were up uh, a lot of, and so because teachers were free to teach and not 
be plagued with disciplinarians. They weren't disciplinarians. And so there are all kinds of creative interventions, but, it will, but if we have assumed that, that the teachers are just racist and then told the teachers, as is being done in some states, not to suspend students if, it's, if this, it has a disparate impact on black students. No, we challenge the students' behavior and improve their behavior. And as a consequence, uh, attendance improve, uh, fewer expulsions, uh, violence was down, learning improved. And so, but that's what you get when you look at the, the, the problem that's beyond race and begin to address the behavior of the students. Thank you, Bob. We do have some questions. So I'll go to John Farabee and then Becky Hammond next. Okay, hello. Thank you, Kimberly. And um, thank you, uh, Bob and Ian, for sharing your time and thoughts with us. Uh, it's very much appreciated. I have a simple question. It would seem to me that um, some of the charter schools demonstrate very conclusively that CRT and the aims of 1619 Project are are, are, are ridiculous because there's, they've had great success in inner, inner city schools with predominantly um, uh, black um, students. I wonder if you could comment on that, please. I'm not aware of any of them, and I could simply be uninformed on this matter, but I'm not aware of any of them using a CRT. So I, I have run, uh, so for the last 10 years, I ran public prep, which is a network of public charter schools in the heart of the South Bronx and the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And now I'm launching a new network of international baccalaureate high schools uh, to start in 2022. And generally you're right. I mean, the, the charter school movement by design uh, went into communities like the ones I was just talking about, where only 2% of the kids were graduating from high school ready for college. Just to give you a sense, in our schools, 70% of our boys were passing the math exam, while only 2% of kids were graduating from high school ready for college. So yes, there are some great charter schools, I'd like to include um, uh, ours as one of them, that is doing great things for kids. But even in New York City, uh, the charter schools only represent about 11% of the total population of 1.1 uh, million kids. So there's still a lot of pain and suffering. There's still a lot of kids that don't have access to school choice. So if that's, a, if that's something you're uh, going to focus on in Connecticut, that would be of real benefit to your kids. The one thing I will say, though, and I'll say this with, with um, displeasure, uh, is that some of my colleagues in the charter sector, even those like Kip uh, and who've, who've run great networks, critical race theory is infecting them as well. So even mm -hmm. Kip, who's, um, they had a slogan for many years called work hard, be nice. They, they retired that last year because they say uh, meritocracy is an illusion. You know, hard work is, is a false promise to kids, you know, the last thing low-income kids need to hear is that hard work doesn't matter or meritocracy is an illusion. You're literally robbing them of the one thing that they know if they count on that, they can be successful. So even within the charter sector, um, uh, the wokeness is happening and, and people like me are trying to fight, fight against that movement. I'll give you just one other quick example is the Piney Wood School is a 110 year old black boarding school in Pineywood, Mississippi. And they only take children from very uh, distressed families. A hundred percent are on scholarship. And 96% of these kids who go there in the ninth grade and graduate in 12th grade, 96% go on to college. Uh, so the, we, we, they demonstrate that these children if given a, 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 a proper environment can learn. Also, Ian, would you speak to the fact that 3.5 million Blacks in this country are, are, are African and Caribbean, and how do they fare? If racism were the sole culprit, why aren't all Blacks suffering equally? I believe Nigerians, Ghanaians, mm -hmm. would you speak to that? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of data. When you look at uh, entry into elite colleges, for example, of the Black population that is um, uh, entering, 60, 70% of those students typically are first or second uh, genera you know, uh, um, generation immigrants, as Bob says, from 
uh, African countries, from Caribbean countries. There are also native born uh, blacks, but within that population, they're normally uh, children who've been raised and married to parent households. So clearly there are factors that are driving huge uh, groups of black people to be successful, which is why one of the, the most important adjectives that we put in front of the word racism, and you'll typically hear systemic, institutional, structural. Well, I wanna put in a, a different adjective, uh, which is surmountable, which is that racism exists, but it's surmountable racism. We, you know, there's almost no, there's no country in the world in which racism or some other form of tribalism doesn't exist. The question is, how do we make it so it is surmountable? Whereas the choices that you make in your life, you have the ability to succeed. So surmountable racism mm -hmm. needs to become the adjective that you respond with. I think there's surmountable racism. That's what we need kids to understand. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Becky Hammond and then David Lancaster. Hey, everybody, just hope you can hear me. I'm um, an educator from Connecticut. I've been here 35 years. I grew up in uh, uh, country schools in Montana with Native Americans. Most of those were my classmates. Um, but I've been a teacher and a principal in Connecticut as well as New York State. And I'm just, I'm on the school board here in Stanford. So I'm gonna put myself out there. Um, I am just, excited to hear what you're having to say and what's happening here. And I, I've been an educator. I've had training in CRT. Um, that's what they do in, you know, in Connecticut. Um, and of course at New York, you know, I'm certified in New York. But my big question is here is about mindset because how do we get you onto the, um, the track that starts breaking down data and telling it like it really is. Because um, in Stanford, we have uh, some small, uh, we have uh, special interest groups coming forward and painting it like, you know, it's just, it's not true. And I just, how do we get you guys into that level? And how can we help you in Connecticut? I think through schools, but Kimberly, how, how do we do this? I'd love to help. <laughs> Ian, Bob, help us. <laughs> well, well I, I do think the data story is an important one because you will typically see people come to you with data solely through the prism of race. They'll say black kids are only achieving at this level and white kids percentage wise are achieving at this level. And therefore that gap must be structural racism. It must be either implicit or explicit bias of the teachers that's driving that. So therefore we need to have anti-bias training. All the white people need to go here. All the non-white people need to go there. The white people need to confess their oppressor. Like this, this movie is playing in every single state across the country. One of the ways, one of the ways to uh, address that is to put more data on the table, which is to show, as I did in Rhode Island, and and um, I'm happy to send I'm happy to send the analysis that I did um, in Rhode Island because it might be a helpful model for you to pursue in Connecticut, where again I just looked at the the raw numbers of white students who were failing. It dwarfed the number of black kids. So just to first take off the table that it's only black kids that are failing, and then if you have the ability to break down data even more, if you look at through the prism of family structure, other items, you start to see that there's some uh, glaring gaps uh, that don't have to do with just race. And by doing this, you're not saying that racism doesn't exist, but you're, you're putting it into context. You're giving it a sense of what's the proportion that really matters here. Let me give you a, for example, I just testified um, at, in the US Congress, the, uh, then the focus was on the racial wealth gap because the analysis was if you look at the average wealth, uh, the median wealth of an average white family, it's about $160,000 more than the median wealth of the average black family. And for some people, they look at that $160,000 gap and say, see, that's the evidence. That's structural racism. It's a legacy of discrimination. Individual people can't do anything to solve that problem. So therefore, 
the government must have a $15 trillion reparations program just to pay every black person um, that $160,000. But if you take into account just two other factors, uh, education level and family structure, so college educated, married uh, black uh, um, households, ha their median wealth is $160,000 more than the median wealth of a white single parent household. So the, the point is that you can play with data all the time, but if you only are looking through the prism of race, you can tell one story that um, is un undermined once you are more uh, accurate. And again, I, I, I'm doing this uh, a lot. And I think so I think one of, the, one of the ways to do this is to tell that story. Another way, another way to do it, um, and, I, and some of you may have seen this recently, but Harvard, uh, Harvard University has just been sued by a group called, uh, I think the Students for Fair Admissions. And they're basically saying that Harvard's admissions policy is discriminatory against the Asian community. If you're a black student and Harvard breaks up it's all of its applicants into 10 academic categories, if you're a black student and you're in either the first or second category, your uh, demonstrated history of getting, of th their, their level of putting kids in, black kids, your chance is 56%, more than one in two chance to get into Harvard University, which is four to five times the likelihood of a, a kid at the same academic level who's either black or, I'm sorry, who's either white or Asian. The point being, and this is not just Harvard, this is virtually every uh, major institution, major college. So we also have to put in the context, the opportunities are enormous, enormous for black kids in this country. And so it's just, you know, you gotta, you gotta bring in some of these other pieces of information, which A, level the playing field to show that it's not just black kids, there are a lot of kids, and by the way, there are a lot of black kids that are doing just fine as Bob said, who are recent immigrants, who are native born, who are married in two parent households, who are doing just fine. And so we have to break this narrative that simply because of your race, that must mean you're an oppressor or you must be oppressed. You know, I guess your, your platform is just so wow. And I just, why are we meeting with these mindsets that there's only one way of thinking about it? Did Congress receive you well? Did you know that <laughs> give you some inroads there in specific states? Yeah, I mean, you know, in Ohio, in that testimony was focused on the 1619 project, but by presenting some of this data, the, the state had put the 1619 project as an official sort of sanctioned resource on their social studies page. But after the testimony, they took it down because they realized there were so many falsehoods inside that curriculum that they couldn't stand behind it as a state. And so, yes, you got to keep fighting. I mean, you're you're on a school board. So and I just ran for school board in my own hometown here in New York. So you're probably seeing it. And I think there's a rising movement that's recognizing even if you know, even if you're genuinely interested in addressing issues of race, upward mobility, the ways in which these folks are proposing to do it is as discriminatory as the ways in which they're complaining against. There's another kind Thank of help. Thank you. Oh, go ahead, Bob, sorry. No, yeah. there's another kind of help on the way too. I'm getting certified as a, a racial exorcist. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll be able to help all of you guilty white people uh, uh, deal with your racism, but I'll only charge $25 an exorcist. I got to get in on the race hustle too. <laughs> well, thank, yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Very helpful. Um, <laughs> David Lancaster and then Ken Goldberg. Great. Thank you, Kim. Uh, thank you, Mr. Woodson and Mr. Rowe. Wonderful, wonderful discussion. Um, I'm, I like the first, Mr. Rowe, I address this to you, the, the quote that you had from Richard Delgado, I thought was spot on. And I think, or don't you think that one of the difficulties that we have with discussing critical race and getting people to understand what it is, is that a lot of people don't know Marxism and they really don't know the roots of Marxism. And I think if you look back at the origins of this kind of philosophy or ideology really, um, 
they're basically substituting race for class and economics. Um, I have a guy who works for me uh, at, at work and uh, he was a, he's a Russian immigrant. I uh, came over in 1986 as a young man. And he says, I grew, Dave, I grew up in, uh, you know, in a school, a school room with Marx and Engels picture up there along with Lenin. He goes, and he studied critical race theory just on his own because he's got kids in school. He says, this is exactly, you know, it's, it's the parallels are just uncanny about shutting down debate uh, you fighting a bogeyman, um, you know, the list goes down, you know, you can go down to the list of, of tactics and, and methodologies, but, you know, we were talking about it and I, and I kind of said to him, he agreed that the problem is, I, I just don't believe that critical race, if these people are interested in solving the race issue, I just don't. I think they're using it as a way to, to divide and destroy society and end story, you know? And right. so anyway, I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, no, I and, and you don't need to exercise me. I don't need any. I don't have any <laughs> no, no, I, I, I agree with you. And, and again, rather than deal with the hyperbole, because they'll say, no, it's not trying to divide people here. Look at this very benign definition uh, that Kimberly read at the very beginning of this. So, so they'll try to define it. That's why I, I always use and I just put it in the chat so that everyone has it. You know, this is what the this is what the definition says. Critical race theory questions the very foundations of the liberal order, including equality theory. That means equality of opportunity, equal rights, and equal protection. So force them to defend that. Force them to defend the fact that critical race theory questions neutral principles of constitutional law. Right. Really? Like, what does that mean? You know, so those are bedrocks of the American democracy. So to me, that's how you 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 lock them in a corner, because oftentimes they'll define this thing in such a way that it's just it's all just soft and nice. It's a little framework. It's not harmful. Meanwhile, it's it's literally undermining the very tenets of American democracy. And you look at the Smithsonian and what happened there, their leadership yeah. uh, on their website posted that track about how whiteness is defined by uh, showing come to work on time, <laughs> delayed gratification, meritocracy, um, competition. In other words, it, it, it is just amazing. And they, they got such a blowback that they had to withdraw it. Uh, and so I, I really think it's, it's insidious what they're doing, but we've got to fight back uh, against it. and. Uh, Fortunately, I think they're engaging in overreach. And that's why the polls are now saying that 70% of Americans uh, are opposed to this. Uh, the, 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 one, the one thing I'll say there is that uh, Bob is right. There's definitely a tide turning. And there are a number of states creating legislation to stop, quote unquote, teaching critical race theory. One thing I think... Um, people who are concerned about this issue have to be careful of right. to not, not go, not have the pendulum swing all the way to the other side where it may seem that you're now trying to ban speech or that you're trying to ban an idea. So something like critical race theory, in my view, you know, the American experiment is based on a free expression of ideas, even the ideas we don't like, right? So you have to allow them to be discussed in my view, critical race theory can't be taught onto its own because then it becomes critical race theology. It has to be taught alongside the very ideas that it's seeking to repudiate. So if you're gonna teach critical race theory, you've got to teach equality theory next to it. You've got to teach neutral principles of constitutional law. And in my view, that's really to be taught at the, uh, at the university level, maybe high school seminar, but certainly not generally K to 12. What you've really got to focus on are the practices that go alongside critical race theory. So those are the like a, a like a privilege walk, where some of you may have heard of. That's where students are all lined up in a horizontal line, and they're told if you're white, take three steps forward because of white supremacy, but if you're black, take five steps backward because you're oppressed. That's an example of an action that violates the Title VI provision of the Civil Rights Act that prohibits racial discrimination. Or, uh, or often what's done where teachers are separated and the white teachers are forced to 
publicly declare their oppressive tendencies. Well, that's a violation of First Amendment because it's compelled speech. And so the more that the laws that are created aren't seeking to ban discussion of an idea or ban the teaching of slavery, because obviously we need to teach slavery and all the history, but we, we, you, what we can use is the same apparatus that was created in the 1960s to ban segregated water fountains. That same apparatus can be used to ban the practices that are associated with critical race theory. Bob and Ian, um, we have six more questions and uh, we're getting close to eight o'clock, but I hope you can hang on to answer our last six questions. Uh, Ken Goldberg and then Peter Crumbine. Good evening. Uh, first off, uh, Kimberly, thanks so much for representing us here in Stanford and Greenwich. I'm a concerned Stanford parent and uh, Bob and Ian, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. I think you're both rock stars. I've listened to much of uh, and read much of uh, what you've uh, been speaking about with 1776 and CRT and admire your work. Uh, I, uh, Ian, I really particularly like the example that you gave of charter schools, uh, charter school caps as an actual example of systemic racism. Uh, and also your comment about flipping the script because what we're facing certainly in Stanford is CRT proponents who number one, gaslight the public and deny that the diversity and equity policy includes CRT, even though it's laced with all the language that you refer to. And even though the clear import of what they're doing in the workshop trainings and soon to be teacher trainings uh, derives straight from CRT dogma. Uh, but uh, one of my, I have a couple of questions that are related uh, one is, what is the best way to persuade the religious zealots that support CRT that disparate impact doesn't equal evidence of causation of racism causing the, the, the disparity? And uh, I'm also wondering what relevance science and the common use of a control group in scientific experiments could be used to effectuate uh, you know, the intellectual elite's uh, change of heart and more critically examining these issues instead of reflexively following the progressive playbook. Yep. Again, thank you very much for your insights. Yeah, no, these are all great questions. And uh, you know, full disclosure, you know, I live in a small town in New York um, and at the beginning of this year, there was an equity audit done. And there were a number of people that you might describe as zealots um, who uh, were very, very happy to see that this document was created and it showed racial disparities between the percent of black kids passing the, the local exams versus the percentage of white students. And again, for them, that was proof. There was no, nothing else mattered. And again, I, and again, I'm happy to share, I did a, a nine page critique of the Pelham Equity Audit and then um, shared that with the entire town. And I think it was very powerful in slowing down um, uh, what was about to happen. And then I decided to run for school board and I won. So I'm now a school board member. Um, but again, in this analysis, which you'll see, I, I again, I just went to the data and I looked at the, the raw numbers of white kids that were not reading in our town. It dwarfs the number of black kids, even though the percent differences are high. So it's not that we don't want to know, well, why is the percent of black kids not performing well? It could be due to multiple things, but there are also a large number of white kids not doing well. Why aren't they doing well? And there's probably a lot of overlap. If we just sit down and say, is it because of teacher recruitment, teacher training, not high enough academic standards? We don't have an academic dashboard. Someone just put a question in here about academics. If academics is the focus, a lot of these issues go away because you know, you fill the void of not talking about academics by, well, let's get a diversity and equity and inclusion director. Let's, let's talk about social justice. Let's talk about cultural competence, which as Bob said earlier, none of it's tied to improving academic outcomes for kids. There's no data whatsoever that says any of this. And so again, I'll send you, I'll, I'll share with Kimberly the, uh, cause I do think they're helpful um, 
uh, exemplars that could be uh, followed in virtually every town. And Bob, Thanks. could you share your thoughts on Ken's question on how to be persuasive? Well, he, he is the expert on that one, but I, I just think that you, you've got to, <clears throat> I think it, people like Ian need to share the, the, his strategies for pushing back against those who came after him uh, uh, on it too. I just think the strategies about how you win uh, is, is important. He won, um, in fact, he got the most votes uh, when he ran uh, in his race. And so uh, I, I think that- By a wide margin. Huh? By a wide margin. By a wide margin. <laughs> and even though there were threats and all kinds of, of foolishness, it just shows you that some people are well-intended but misguided and they can be persuaded to change. Um, and so I just think we have to be, we have to be faithful and, and, and and, and, and mobilize all. But also I just think what the reason that we put 1776 together is because the radical left is using the black community as a proxy to bludgeon this country and destroy its institutions. And so since they were using uh, the black community we thought that the leadership pushing back against it should also be black. And that's why we put 1776 together. But we were offering not a point by point debate but an alternative vision and an inspirational narrative so people will be inspired uh, uh, to change. Thank you, Bob, thank you. Uh, Peter Crumbine and then Robert Hamm. Uh, yes, um, I'd like to make a comment about uh, charter schools and see if our speakers would agree with it. Um, by way of background, our uh, son, taught for many years for, with KIPP Academy in Houston. Uh, so we've seen firsthand what charter schools can accomplish. One of the things that gets me riled up is that the opponents to charter schools uh, talk about the money being siphoned into charter schools um, from the other public schools, but uh, charter schools don't just take money, they take students. And so since Charter schools generally cost less per, 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 per pupil uh, than the uh, overall uh, money available for, for a public school, other public schools is bigger, not smaller on a per pupil basis. So I'd like to get a comment from our speakers on that. I mean, you just put forth a very rational argument for why charter schools should be supported because they are public schools but there is irrational opposition to us. So, so that, I mean, so everything you just said is correct, uh, but the, the narrative that the unions and others push is that somehow we're degrading um, the overall uh, public school system. Again, even though there's incredible evidence of when uh, public charter schools hit a certain concentration within a particular town, the, all, the overall performance of all the schools rise because there's a sense of competition where even the more traditional district schools uh, improve their output. So everything you said is right. And I wish we had a, a bigger um, you know, bullhorn to, to promote that. Um, but unfortunately the unions have, are winning on that narrative. Um, well, and by the way, I, did, I just put in the, in the chat the critique that I wrote of the equity audit that occurred in Pelham. Thank you. Bob, did you want to say something? So just a, a quick comment. One of the things we did in Milwaukee uh, 20 years ago is that I told, uh, I was involved in the choice effort there and big time. But I also said, we are for choice in education, which did not mean that we were hostile to public schools or public education. And so what we did, I raised, raised some money from the private foundations and to hire youth advisors that served as uh, uh, interventions and, and, and improved a lot of, of, of public schools so that we increase. So I think it's important in our approach and our strategy is to uh, do what we can to make public schools safer so that students can, can, who are confined there will have a better, better education. And I think it makes a better case for us to support choice in education and vouchers when we are perceived as not being hostile to public education. Thank you. 
And so great to hear from you, Peter. He, Peter Crumbine is a former selectman of the town of Greenwich. So great to have you. Um, Robert Hamm and then Linda Lavelle. And the last question will go to Kara Philbin. Representative Fiorello, thanks for putting this together. And Dr. Woodson, Dr. Rowe, thank you so much. A very simple question. Is it even remotely possible that this entire CRT push by the left is to redirect attention from their failures of good intentions uh, via the legislation of since 1965 and uh, I'm told $22 trillion of our tax dollars that have been spent. Thank you very much. Yeah. But I believe, yes, I, I've written a lot about the, the $22 trillion. Uh, that's more money than it, it, you could buy all the agricultural land. That's more money that we spent fighting all of our wars. And 70% and of all those dollars went to an industry that asked which problems are fundable, not which ones are solvable. So we've created a commodity out of poor people. And that's why we're in this mess we're in today without moving the needle on poverty in the last 50 years. We haven't done that. And, and now the same government that is responsible for that destruction is now going to intervene and say they can make the best decisions for people <laughs> when it comes to education. Uh, so uh, we must be vigilant and continue to push uh, as hard as we can. Thank you, Bob. Linda Lavelle and then Kara. Linda, you're muted. Mm, you're still muted. Kara, can you unmute while Linda figures out her mute button? There we go. Oh, is she? Yeah, oh, there she goes. Okay. One comment and, and two questions um, besides thanking these gentlemen for a really uh, an amazing discussion tonight. I'm very impressed. But Connecticut has, I call it corrupt. I, you may have a, a gentler view, but the way it works in Connecticut is that the teachers unions give major political donations to every Democrat in our legislature and uh, the teachers unions uh, absolutely refuse to have more. I think we have a three, I, I'm not sure of the number, charter schools in Connecticut, but they put their foot down and the legislature um, just goes right along because that's where their campaign donations come from. And I, I think that's a corrupt system. But anyway, I um, wanted to know how many school systems have you been able to get the 1776 project into? And have you had a lot of pushback from boards of eds or superintendents? Bob, do you want to share the number? Yeah, we, we what have we had about 15,000 yeah, downloads of our curriculum in a period, a short, a matter of weeks. Uh, 1619 had 4,500 in the course of a year. And wow. we had 16, 000, 15,000 downloads in a, a, a matter of weeks. In all 50 states. In all 50 states. So it is, it is very exciting. It is very exciting. So we've got teachers in private schools, district schools, charter schools, parochial schools, after schools, home schools, prison ministries. Um, wherever uh, character formation is happening for kids. So it's really exciting. So as, as Kimberly shared with you at the beginning, right now we've got 12 units and this is just at the high school level. We haven't even really rolled out our elementary and middle, our middle school units as well. And so what we think it's indicative of is that there is a thirst for quality content that tells a more complete story of the African-American experience in the United States. And 1619 Project for, for a little while was the only game in town telling a very, in our view, one-sided and we think false uh, view. And so we had to have an alternative. So are we getting pushback? Um, uh, I mean, there are certainly people who, 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 who don't like the fact that we've created this compelling alternative, but we think the fact that more than 15,000 uh, teachers and such have downloaded 
our content is, it, you know, it, it, it's, very, it's very gratifying to us. Let, let me just add too that our book, uh, Black, uh, White, Black, Red, and White, has been down, uh, has, we've had uh, 15,000 uh, books sold in a matter of weeks. And Am it was a leading book on Amazon. And they, had, they ran out of print. So now they're on back order. We've had 5,000 ebooks sold and 15,000 hardcover and paperback sold. And there's still uh, 3,000 back ordered. So we really think it's been a tremendous outpouring of, of support for, for this content. We're just really, really uh, happy. Great. Great, thank you. And the last question goes to Kara Philbin. Hi. Um, thank you, Kimberly, Bob, and Ian. This has been wonderful. Um, so informative. Um, I have just, um, I'll start with my question, but I also have a comment that I'd love to follow up with. But um, my question was, I'm seeing about, I, in, my, in my opinion, you have about 80% of, um, I think there's a mismanagement academically. You're having 80% dedicated to social emotional learning, um, other and technology. And I, I'm seeing about 20% dedicated to academics. And I'm seeing, I'm seeing, uh, you know, people who really trust the system. I'm seeing 10 kids put into a reading intervention in, in fifth grade um, as a Hail Mary for middle school. So in my opinion, as a parent, it's almost like they've traded places. Like they don't trust us as parents and they're kind of doing this behavioral job and we don't necessarily trust them as teachers because of the curriculum we're finding um, and this call to action for our children. And, you know, I have a, a 12 year old who still plays with dolls who learned about these horrors. Like, I love how you say to go from terror to triumph. There is no triumph. And so I find it very depressing for a 12 year old. Exactly. Um, but I think there's something really to say about rigor and academics. I mean, it builds confidence, it builds character, people feel good about themselves. I feel rigor and academics corrects a lot of the behavioral issues. I don't, do you find that to be true or? Very much, very much. I mean, the reason I'm launching a new network of high schools, an international baccalaureate high school character-based is that it's really hard, you know, and you have to study, you have to write, you have to, you know, you have to read a lot of books and, you know, you fill that time with engaging work and with, by the way, really rich content with diverse authors. So, you know, you can, you can address issues of, you know, our kids seeing uh, people that look like them, people are, you know, so there's a way to do this without demonizing whole groups of people, but you got to fight at it. I mean, again, in my own hometown, I've just joined the board. I've discovered that we don't have an academic dashboard. So what that means is at the board level, each meeting, we're not, we're not laser focused on how are kids doing in math and reading and science? How are students in special education doing? You know, what are our, what about our kids with accommodations? Like, what are we doing? What are we doing? In the absence of that, you fill the void with all this other social emotional stuff, which is not that it's unimportant, but as you just, I think very wisely said, that's not the primary function of school, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, you know, and so I, I think that's a really brilliant um, analogy that the, the roles have been flipped in a way. I think that's really wise. And then I just, I wanna thank you so much for being leaders in this movement. And I wanna counter, you know, we're having a lot of issues in Greenwich and um, we have a group of parents who are trying their best to navigate it. Um, I've also had the privilege of listening to a call with a bunch of Hudson Valley um, districts that are countering this as well. And it was very interesting, but I heard a pattern. There was a pattern that emerged. It started with a student, a student editorial um, about racism in the school. You then, I think that was the, that justified the need to bring these programs in. That yeah. particular school, they piloted a program without BOE approval or community knowledge. Yeah. And that school's had a lot more issues than the others. Yeah. Um, interestingly, a lot of these towns are having a student blog started in August, just before the school year 
where the kids are talking about racism in school, which there again justifies the need. And then interestingly, the blog stop in November, which I credit to the fact that college applications have been sent in. <laughs> okay. But then what happens is, is there is a, and I can't remember the name of the organization, but they are training, they do conferences. So you have a new group coming in um, that are being, you know, going to these conferences. And um, I do know one of the candidates running for BOE, they use the students to counter their, their, those candidates winning. They wrote editorials to blow up their chances for the BOE. Um, and they countered us in our last BOE meeting. They sent in 10 students to counter us. So my, I, I kind of, I, I feel there's a real big issue with the academics. Greenwich had no literacy program until two years ago. They wouldn't even introduce it to struggling readers, only kindergartners. Yet they'll, they'll buy a software program called securely.com, which spies on all the kids. Um, so there's a real academic problem. And I personally think, like, I think you're great leaders, but I think you need great student leaders as well, yep. because I feel a really good counter. And what I'm going to try to start in Greenwich is an academic counter to it. Kids so there's a today that start a blog and counter that, like, I really wish that I, you know, what didn't have videos reading to me, I actually read. I guess that's about, you know, so I feel like you counter it with students talking about how the academics are letting them down and disappointing them to kind of counter the other movement. I, I don't know if you might want to think about something like that as well, because I think the students and the academics in the end will be more powerful, which gets back to your data. Yep. So there's an organization called uh, the Foundation against intolerance and racism. I'm, I'm putting it in the chat right now. Um, uh, fairforall.org. And uh, it's a relatively new organization, but it's been created for the special um, purpose that you're talking about, which is that it's they've created a group of K to 12 learning standards, which is a way to talk, you know, is to fight bigotry without spreading bigotry. Uh, they're creating uh, student leaders who are who become trained in what are called the fair standards. So it's people who are truly anti-racism, truly against racism, that stand for equality of opportunity, individual dignity, common humanity. So this may be a group to check out because they're creating a, a way for students to join um, forces to fight against uh, much of this uh, DEI type work. It, it, that was, there was one of their calls that I listened to. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, and Hudson Valley, right. Because yeah. fair. Yeah. So I, I would definitely take advantage of the resources that they are putting together. You don't have to start from scratch. That's a, that's a really important lesson. There are a number of groups. There's fair for all. There's parents defending education. There's um, Alliance for Freedom. Uh, there is legal insurrection. Um, uh, I, I, again, Kimberly, if it's helpful, I can send this to you, but know that you are not the only parents in the country who are concerned about this. And there are a number of groups that are, that are fighting back on the legal front, on the school board front, uh, and on the curriculum front. Thank you so much. Um, we've come to 820. Um, I can't thank you enough, Ian and Bob, for your time. I do want to give you uh, both the last word before we close our call. And um, if, if you find appropriate, Bob, I, I heard you speak about a sports analogy when we talk about equity. And uh, I thought that was so fantastic. If you wanted to share, maybe we could end on that note. But Ian and Bob, I'd like to give you the last word and extend our great gratitude for your time tonight to zoom into Connecticut to share with us uh, your encouragement and the work that you're doing on 1776. And also I'd love to know which one is your favorite story that you've worked on? Um, they all seem really fabulous. <laughs> Thank you. Well, for me, the, my favorite is uh, the Rosenwald schools. It's because it's, it's such an incredible example of uh, the resiliency of black people in the face of Jim Crow segregation. I mean, imagine, Booker T. Washington with Julius Rosenwald, they built nearly 5,000 schools exclusively for black children in 14 states. 
throughout the South and as Bob said, incredible uh, academic achievements. That, that's, that's one of my favorite stories, which many people don't know about. Um, I, I will just close by uh, reading, um, you know, Martin Luther King back in 1962 on the hundredth anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation, he was asked to speak. And I, I just found his opening words really powerful. He said, quote, if our nation had done nothing more in its whole history than to create just two documents, its contribution to civilization would be imperishable. The first of these documents is the Declaration of Independence, and the other is that which we are here to honor tonight, the Emancipation Proclamation. All tyrants, past, present, and future, are powerless to bury the truths in these declarations, no matter how extensive their legions, how vast their power, nor how malignant their evil, end quote. I just feel that those, he's so prescient. All tyrants are powerless to bury the truths in these declarations, the Declaration of Independence and the Emancipation Proclamation. And I just feel that, you know, uh, those words in my view sum up how we have to be strong in standing up for what those documents represented. Beautiful. And last word to you, Bob. Two of my favorites, that ones that are kind of a footnote to the first one that Ian gave, is that there were five black high schools at the turn of the century in our major cities. Uh, Dunbar High School in, in Baltimore, Booker T in Atlanta, New York, um, and Washington, DC. Every one of these schools uh, there were 50 students to a classroom. They used used textbooks. They had half the budgets of white schools. Every one of those black schools in 1920 out-tested every white school in those cities. Every one. Um, that's one. But one of my other favorite stories is from Robert Smalls. He was a man who was born in Sumter, South Carolina, <clears throat> and he worked on a, a supply ship he and the six crewmen after their, bought, their uh, slave master went into town, commandeered the ship and picked up their families and rode past, successfully past five Southern garrisons and turned the ship over to the Union Navy. He was celebrated, became wealthy after the war, served in Congress. Uh, he was one of those blacks who, would, who was born a slave who died a millionaire. He went back and purchased the plantation on which he was a slave and took in the, the destitute family of the slave master. She was delusional. He even permitted her to sleep in her own bed. There is an example of radical grace in action. If, if a man, Robert Small, could express that radical grace today, then it, it, it makes the case for why we should seek redemption and transformation. Uh, but, and, and finally, I, I really think that, that this is a wonderful country and there are, America is in a moral and spiritual free fall. And there are many other problems, perplexing problems confronting our young people that we need to solve, but we're not gonna do it if we have to always look at each other through the suspicious prism of race. So again, the Woodson Center's goal is to de-racialize race and desegregate poverty. Thank you so much, Bob. Thank you for all your work. Thank you for being thought leaders. Thank you, Ian, and thank you, Bob. Thank you, everyone, for joining tonight. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you.